One of my best friends from college loves being scared. He loves being scared. He'll go to scary movies, and he'll laugh out loud during the scary parts. Uh, we would often, during college, we'd load up in a car, and we would go out to kind of surrounded neighboring towns from Stillwater, some abandoned places, and, and he loved going inside. And then he loved screaming at us when we'd all go inside. He, he's the guy who almost attacks people at a haunted house. He, he loves it. And I just think he's a psychopath in how he does this. Uh, one time he was, uh, for a period of years, he was living in Orlando where there's this abandoned uh, theme park that when I came down, he had been waiting for months to take me there and go over the walls and just wander around. And it was horrifying. And he said that it was better than his wedding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He told me that he just thinks scary things are hilarious because they're fake. And who really cares? It's like a movie is jumping out at you. It's not real. It's a movie. And I'm like, no, it's, it's terrifying. Uh, one thing that I've learned uh, is that oftentimes scary things appear very real, and we shouldn't be afraid of them. And then sometimes scary things are very real, and we should be afraid of them. But what about when something is real and it appears terrifying? What do you do? What do you say when something approaches you that you don't feel like you can handle? I'm told by my wife, Brooke, that I can be from time to time very unhelpful when I say things like, don't worry about it. Or, don't be scared. Stop being anxious. I'm told that's not a helpful thing to say. Or even when I try to teach her what I know about God's determinative will versus his decreed will. I think it's a blessing to her that she gets this theologian or theological lesson in the midst of being terrified at the future. It's, it's basic theology, Brooke. We're fine. And I'm not going to be up here and justify myself, even though I think I'm pretty helpful from time to time. But we... <laughs> We all instinctively do that with loved ones or friends. We, we feel like we can help the situation by telling them it's, it's not as bad as you might think because of something that we've endured or you've endured before you. We want to jump in and diffuse the situation by doing what? Ultimately, by reminding them of how God has carried you through certain situations before, or God has aided you or helped you or put others around you. We want to help people by reminding them. The people who would have first received this book, the book of Genesis, uh, these verses would have felt very much in trouble. The, the first audience of this text would have felt very overwhelmed, both by an enemy that was aiming to kill them and by the circumstances where it looked like they were going to be killed. They were, bit by bit though, being brought closer to the promised land. God was guiding them, shoving them, prodding them on into what was called the promised land, which sounds very nice, but they knew once they got into the promised land, that's truly when the real fighting would happen. Uh, they were called to not only go in, but to drive out God's enemies, the Canaanites. And time and time again, these Israelites would have been fearful of all of the battles that seemed to be in front of them. And so with that as a backdrop, the author has shown them the author of this text uses this passage to show them, who would later receive them, who's made everything. In whatever trial you're going through, remember that it was God who made everything. And he reminds them why things are the way they are. He reminded them of how sin entered the world, how we're subjected to the futility of creation, how a flood overwhelmingly wiped out despair except preserving one, men, one group of men and women, and even through that sin, appeared once again, and everyone got to where they were and why they act the way they do. He then shows them or reminds them everything is happening like this. And let me just give you a glimpse of something that has happened before that should give you a bunch of encouragement, the Tower of Babel. Our sermon passage this morning comes from what is very commonly known as the Tower of Babel. And while everyone, it seems, to know something about it, even other myths or even other religious pursuits aim to deal with the Tower of Babel in some way, recognizing that it was historically a fact and happened and appeared in everyone's viewpoint, and it's a, it's a feature of history, like the flood, like creation. And so Moses gives the people of God this lesson, this understanding, so that they would be shaped as they go into a time of terror. So you and I, too, this is given to us so that we are shaped by what seems like just a bizarre story of a construction gathering gone bad. 
Now, to better understand this text before we kind of get into some points, I want you to see the broader context that this text is in. In the creation narrative, God not only created human beings in His image, but it says that He blessed them and He told them, be fruitful, go multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. So they're, they're bound together, right? They've been wandering together. And God, His intention is for them to fill the earth, meaning go away and populate the earth. But at Babel, they were refusing to fill the earth. Instead of spreading out, they wanted to go up. Now, in verse 1, this is a truly captivating thing in our minds. Everyone speaks, it says, everyone here speaks the same language. There's no barrier of tongue. But Babel isn't about linguistic confusion. In, In totality, it's actually about, well, it's a story of authority. It's another story of worship, where these people wanted to make a name for themselves. They, they wanted to worship whatever their pursuit was. So again, Israelites receiving this, put yourself in their shoes. They would have received this. They would have been in a place of fear and overwhelming exhaustion, possibly wondering if the God who they've been worshiping for a while will ultimately and finally provide. And Moses says to them through this word, hey, remember Babel. So let's remember. And where I want to take you in this is I want you to see man I want you to see God as the outline that you hopefully have on the bulletin that you've been given. But I have a third point, and this third point is a conclusion, but it will actually take half of my time. So if you are really excited by the end of point two, there's more. Now, I, want, I think it's very helpful to focus, and, and the text does this for us, to focus on man's particular actions here. This is in verses one through four. There is a real problem surrounding the Tower of Babel. And the problem wasn't how high it would go or the bricks that were used or even what's going on inside of the tower. The actual problem with the tower are the builders of that very tower. There's an immediate conflict here that Moses brings our attention to. Look at verse 2 of the text. A new human invention arrives on the scene. This invention is baking bricks in an oven. People said there, look, the plurality of people said there, let us make bricks. And you think, how is that tense? Big whoop. They're just making bricks. Who doesn't want to take mud and put straw on it and bake it and make a giant tower? But it continues to go on. Moses continues to narrate this scene for us. Look at verse 4. It says, Come, let us build a city for ourselves and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we should be scattered. I think it's helpful to look at these passages in, in two ways. I want you to see kind of what the hands are doing, so in man's action, what the hand is doing, but also where the, where the heart is as well. Think of, think of the hands of these people. Take a major step back and look at how this was written. What are these hands doing? In, a, in desiring to build a city, what Moses, I think, is brilliantly bestowing on the readers of this text, Moses is showing that they are acting actually a lot like Cain. Wanting to build a city. We've seen that before. What, what was Cain known for? He was cursed, and then he went and built a city. And these people, they wanted to build a city. The, the seed of the serpent is now alive and well, and these people who, in anger and rebellion from God, aim to build a city. They're acting like Cain with their hands. But, but also, uh, they want the city to be something significant. It's not just any other tower. It's not just any other city. They want it to be prominent in the landscape. This city will have a tower What kind of tower? A high tower, visible from far away, which is ironic, right? Because they're supposed to go far away to where they can see something else, but they want to make a tower so that if anyone else would go wandering away or go far away, they would actually know where to come home. Again, there's there's a sense of scattering here and clinging to home base and scattering and clinging, and Moses is just wonderfully showing the irony of this. But it's not just going to be a high tower that you can see from afar. It, it's going to be a celestial tower, a cosmic tower. Look at that. With its top to the heavens. Finally, after God's absence in the garden, they think that this will link heaven and earth. Now, most interpreters think that it would look like some kind of stepped pyramid that was common in that part of the world at that time. Kind of a stepped pyramid with a stairway on its side. Why? They say in this text, why do they want it? this pyramid-looking tower to have steps so that God himself would condescend in order to be around his people. What, what an option they are giving God. We're going to make you a tower so that you can come and hang out with us. So you see their hands at work, but also you see their heart. Look, the narrator behind the text gives us the motivation of what they're doing, not just what they're doing, but the, why they're doing what they're doing. The first thing that we see here 
being shown to us, it says in verse 4, to make a name for ourselves. So we see yet another case in the Scriptures where pride is just seeping to the top. Now, make a name for ourselves. Just hover over that. Let's hover over that for a little bit. These people aren't just defying God's will by not spreading out. It's not just that they're defying God's will by not spreading out, but they're also denying His very word. They deny Him. Look back at verse 2 in the chapter. The people were, it says, moving eastward, away from Eden, like Adam and Eve, like Cain. They were moving, so that looks all right. They're spreading out a little bit, but here, they stop. We'll go here. I want to plant here. I want to be here. This is, this is my land. Look how great it can be. Like Cain, they plan to build a city with a tower with its tops to the heavens. And like Adam and Eve, they wanted to be like God where a name would be given to themselves, from themselves. Moses here shows their heart's intention, not only in how they went about their business, but also how they wanted their name to be known. And also, this is the language of saying what's what in their own ambition. Back in chapter 1 of Genesis, in verse 26, Moses shows God creating man. In this language, it says, in the same way, Let us make man in our own image. Moses is showing that man here in Babel is aiming to be like God, not only disobeying God, but also wanting to be like God, creating and and collectively saying, let us be glorified. In the same way that the triune God at the beginning said, let us make man in our own image. Their lust for fame, for power, for notoriety, for independence, they can have it all. One theologian points out, look look at the people in the Scriptures who received names before the Tower of Babel. Look at all those people who received names in the past, all those lists of names, all those names who were granted. How do these people get their name? It's not hard to figure out. They were given a name. A superior would crown another with a title saying, you'll be called John, or you'll be called woman, or you'll be called great. But the desire here is that they would make and give themselves their own name. And it suggests that I want what I want because I want it. They're going, their ambition is for reputation and autonomy. They want to bring glory to themselves. And it seems like Moses is clearly pointing us back to the garden, that the original human offense was wanting to have what was not given to them, but wanting to reach what was not theirs. Remember what was, what was said about the, the two trees in the garden? One was like this and one was like that. What made that other one distinct? Well, nothing other than it didn't belong to Adam and Eve. And in the same way, this name that they longed for, it, it wasn't theirs to crown themselves with. It's a little bit of exegesis, observation, but I want you to not only see the things here in the text with the hands and the heart, but I also want you to put on like a big cowboy theological hat. Think about this theologically. God does make a name for His people. It's not that people aren't given names. Uh, we see in the Scriptures that people are even having names, and then they're given new names. That's what grace actually looks like. I'm, I'm taking you for what you are, and I'm making you new out of the mercy and grace of my own heart. In the very next chapter, we see God actually doing this. God promises Abram in chapter 12, I will make your name great. Here we have in this case people wanting their name to be given to them as great. Later, God makes this promise to David in 2 Samuel, I will make for you a great name. And according to Paul in Philippians chapter 2, God gives Jesus, quote, the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend. And then later in Revelation, John John is shown a vision of Jesus who promises to write on his people in Revelation 3, the name of my God. In the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from my God out of the heaven in my own name. It's God's right to make a name for his people. It is only God's right to do what he does in people's lives. Yet at Babel, people desire a name for themselves. That's really what's going on here. Not only pride, but also vengeance at not wanting to be who they thought they should be. And so they go against God and want to make something for themselves. So that's pride, but there's a second and shorter motivation that's going on here. 
There's a second reason that they're wanting to build this tower. It's even more clearly showing itself as a true defiance of who God is. They want to build because they don't want to leave. They're told to go away. And they're like, well, if we make something here for ourselves, then it will be glorious. Look at verse 4 of the text, in the middle of verse 4. It says, otherwise, if we don't build this tower, otherwise we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. They just want to stay home. They don't want to do what God is telling them to do. And in reality, why is it so bad to stay home? Why is it so bad to not keep wandering? I don't, I don't know if you've ever been wandering. It's not enjoyable. I'm always amazed at people who just go on a walk and they have no idea where they're going to go. They just start walking and you're like, what is wrong with you? Like, how do you not have a destination in mind? Aren't you terrified of just wandering? What's so wrong with that? People spreading across the earth was God's desire. You think all the way back to the garden, all the way after Noah, all the way in this case, what did God desire for his people to do? His desire of them being image bearers would be like giant reflectors towards the end of the earth. What's so great about the earth? Well, it is even greater if it is full of God's people reflecting his glory. So instead of finding shelter and following God's desire and God's will, they thought salvation, a refuge, would come from something that they would make. Instead of actually following God's will in righteousness, pursuing Him in holiness, they thought, if I make something for myself, then that will bring me total refuge and decent salvation. You can think of your own life and ponder about how this can so easily be applied to the fear that we have. Am I following the Lord's will or am I making for myself this refuge? So that's man's actions. Why don't you see God's actions, too, in verses 5 through 9, the rest of the story. The, the Lord is quick to respond to his human's rebellion. According to verse 5, it says there in the text, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which mortals had built. This response is similar to how he acted before the flood when he came down and saw that the earth was corrupt. But here the Lord had to come down from his heavenly throne to see this city and this tower whose top was supposed to be in the heavens. Friends, I just want to take a moment here and say, do you not see how Moses is mocking these people here? They want to build something so big, so tall, so glorious, and they do. And what's God's response? I have to leave heaven and look for it. (laughs) It's not that tall. It's not that glorious. You thought it was awesome. I had to come down to you and look around. Oh, there's your two-story condo. How awesome are you? Moses is mocking the Babylonians. He's clearly sarcastic. This cute tower, God had to come down and see it. The Bible is often sarcastic anytime it's approaching God's enemies. Why? Because God's enemies look mighty and glorious and powerful, but according to a holy God, they're pathetic. They're just losers. Remember how he talked about creation in the beginning? He used stars to to describe how glorious he was in creation. Part of that was just because there are stars, but also a part of that is because all these Babylonians were actually worshiping stars. He's saying, hey, you thought stars are cool? I made them. Or even in Exodus, you think of these random plagues that that were brought down from the heavens, frogs and blood and rivers and all this kind of stuff. Why, Why was he doing that? He was mocking these people saying, oh, you worship the water? Great, I'm gonna make it blood just mocking him relentlessly. So don't, you know, a lot of us, a lot of us are sarcastic and, and, you know, we're just trying to be like what parts of the Bible are being. So the point here is clear. The unmatched heavenly Lord has to come down from his throne to see what they'd built. And another cutting remark, it says, which mortals, or maybe your translation says, sons of men had built. I, I just have to come down and see what you, what you mortal, mere mortals are doing. The people put a lot of hope in the tower they were building by doing something for themselves and human ingenuity offering themselves great security. See this all the time. People desperately aim to make their lives more secure by by putting up boundaries on themselves, but but their boast toward God had the opposite effect. You think they they were trying to make a refuge for themselves, but what happened was something that was terrifying. God will carry on. It says in verse 6, Look at the passage where it says in verse 6 of the chapter, and the Lord said, behold, they are one people and they all have one language and this is only the beginning of what they will do and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. 
In many ways, God is kind to them by separating them from themselves. The, the kind of work that they are already doing will build up momentum. Man has amazing power to sin against God, and God just wants to stop it, like pump the brakes entirely. God shows kindness, even though they're united against him. They're united, all in agreement, all united in their own defiance. And so in his kindness, he separates them. He sees their hearts. God basically says at the end of verse 6, they'll become even worse if we let them carry on. If they're successful in defying God now, no telling what they'll do next. And for the sake of his kingdom, the Lord intervenes. Twice the people had said, come, let us make bricks. Come, let us build ourselves a great city and a tower. Now God responds with his own in kind, come, let us. In verse 7, come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech And so the Lord goes down. He counterattacks. He counters their threats to his kingdom by confusing their language so that they can no longer understand each other. Their language is what made them defiant in their cooperation against the holy God. And so God actually spreads out their unity and makes them not understand each other. This judgment, and it is a judgment, reveals God's faithfulness to his plan of salvation. He breaks up Babel here. He resets the map. And God's work will begin on earth freshly. In just the next chapter, we see that God's work begins freshly through the person of Abram, then through the people of Israel, and then through the kingdom of David, until his plan will unfold through intentional movements crystallizing in the deliverance of his son being born, who will be from the right kingship, the right people, the right family, and a true king will be born in Bethlehem. God's plan will come through God's people in the person of Christ, in Christ's salvific purpose, capturing his church. Now, the point of all that, the really run-on sentence of like a a zoomed-out picture of the rest of Scripture is remember what God is doing here. God is building on his earth a kingdom where he will reign and rule. And anytime someone threatens that kingdom in this passage and later passages, he comes down and just knocks them over because he's not done until he finally completes what he's going after. So what Babel shows us in the first readers is that it will, from time to time, in your eyes and theirs, it will from time to time appear like evil has gained control. But all this is part of God's plan in spreading his glory broader and deeper. They thought they were being great in staying together, but God actually continued to uh, push forth his plan by dividing them to the ultimate aim where he was spreading his glory broader and deeper. Like yeast used in the New Testament, the people of God and God's purpose will penetrate this world. When he wants something, it will be carried out. But look at verse 8. Look at verse 8 of the passage. What's the result of sin in chapter 11? What's the result of sin in chapter 11? Ultimately, it's fulfillment. Fulfillment of what was promised earlier on. People wanted to stay, but God's will was that they would be scattered and he scattered them. The result of God's action was specifically what they had feared. The Lord scattered them abroad. They they tried to disobey God's will to fill the earth, yet the Lord accomplished his will. I think you can just be, hopefully you can understand what Moses is aiming here. If you're facing this, remember that God's plan always carries through. Remember Babel. When you're facing a giant in front of you, remember Babel. Babel. The Lord always accomplishes his will. Look at verse 9. It concludes the narrative. Therefore, it'll be called Babel because the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. God scatters here the self-reliant. God scatters the self-reliant. It's a beautiful irony. Those who wanted to make a name for themselves do indeed receive a name. But it wasn't from them. It was from their God. It was Babel. They wanted to make a name by settling down. But God gave them a new name by scattering, scattering them out. It's a brilliant wordplay that we see in the Scriptures. I think, I think part of this, this must and should apply to your own heart, but sometimes you just have to take a step back and go, my goodness, the Bible is so majestic and pure in what's going on here. This is not just a story about a giant tower. This is, this is God unfolding His glorious self even through evil here. Now, to conclude, or point three, depending on how long I go, I want, you to, I want you to see man's actions. I want you to see God's actions in response to man. But what I want to do thirdly here is, is take us from 
the beginning of the Scriptures to actually the very end, where, where this narrative of God coming down is actually something that drives through the heart and the rest of Scripture. You can take things away from this passage like trust. You can take things away from this passage like there is a constant battle, pure evil against what God calls as good. You can take away application of what does it look like to properly worship the Lord or walk with the Lord? It doesn't look like this. It does look like this. It, it doesn't look like disobeying. It does look like obeying His Word. You can look at this as consequences for man's sin, but I want you to take away, and what I'll spend the rest of my time doing is actually, hopefully, showing you a bigger picture. There is a grander narrative that is happening within the Tower of Babel and all the way through the rest of the Scriptures. I want to zoom way ahead here because there, there is language starting here that will be carried on through the rest of Scripture. Babel, it will be used otherwise with the word Babylon. There are all these competing armies, if you will, or cities against the very kingdom of God, often referred as practically Babylon, but also alluded to in other parts of the Scriptures as Babylon. So when you think of like an evil representation of people going against a holy God, you can just name them Babylon. You can think of practically Babylon. You could think of how evil Rome would later get. You could think of the wickedness of Las Vegas, or you could even think of Enid. But thousands and thousands of people do not worship their Lord. Babel is the story, though, of God coming down. God coming down here to judge a wicked people. God coming down to judge sin. God coming down to judge people who were reaching up to the heavens, yet reaching with their own hands. But Babel, Babel wasn't the only time that God came down. And Babel wouldn't be the final time that God would come down. God came down another time under the stars of Bethlehem. And that time he didn't come as a spectator or observer. This time he came, what the Bible says, as a man, a a true man, a full man. What makes man a man, that was him. He came down as a man in living color and in human flesh. God came down. He came once more to deal with a wicked humanity, living a perfect life. We're around, he was coming down to people who were reaching for heaven, and this time, even when he was in their midst, they reached for heaven without him. The story of man never seemed to change until he became a man and changed the story completely. This time, coming down, what we see later on in Scripture, he didn't come down to judge people like he did at Babel. He didn't come down to judge people like he did with the flood. He didn't come down to walk in the garden, yet judge people like he did at the beginning, this time, coming down. He would make himself to be the one who would receive judgment. He entered fully into man's judgment. The story that you and all celebrate, that you and I celebrate with the coming of Christmas and the hopeful arrival of Easter is that he came in order to be judged. The reason why the Son of God came was to die. And this time he did die. God the Son, the one of the persons of let us, the one of the triune persons, He came down, and this time he came all the way down. He didn't just come down and survey what was around. He didn't just come down to walk around with God's people. This time he came all the way down, where he entered the dark shadows of judgment in such a way that you could think of Noah going into an ark. This was Jesus going into a tomb where man hung him on a cross to the point of suffocation, to where he would breathe the final breath. And from that cross, he was brought down yet again and buried in a tomb, and death claimed, in our case, yet another one. Nothing new in the biblical narrative. As God comes down, judgment is handed out, and down he went. When Brooke and I lived in Edmond, the church that she grew up in and the church that I was on staff at had a massive sanctuary, and it was uh, built uh, in such a way that you could later install a balcony at the top, but because they didn't need a balcony at that time, uh, they changed that, that area. So like we have a balcony up there. I often meet people who don't know we have a balcony. Guys, look around. Look at them. They, this is their worst nightmare. They're up in the balcony. They're waving. All right. <laughs> this church had a balcony, but then it was changed into you know, Sunday school classes. And it was enclosed. So you couldn't see into those classes, except there was a, there was a door on the northeast side of what could have been a balcony, this giant door. And on the other side of that door was a giant box. And it was protected by a keypad. And by the way, that code is three, just FYI. 
But on that door, high above, everyone in the sanctuary is this black box, and it looks like a telephone booth. And every Sunday, a person sits in that box with a headset and a microphone. And with a headset, this person listens to the sermon, and with a microphone, she translates it into Spanish. It's a pretty cool feature of this church. I don't know if you've ever been to a non-English setting and had to rely on headsets to hear someone else speak. You know, we hear this at like the UN, but also you can do this in other churches. And I'm not talking about taking a tour at the Louvre, you know, where you walk around and someone is telling you something of what you can see. I'm talking about actually being to a non-English speaking church. It is amazing to go into that experience. Though you have, <laughs> you cannot understand what is happening before you. With a headset and with someone translating for you, you are amazingly all in with those around you. It's a moving and beautiful thing to be around people who you have no idea of what they're saying, but by the grace of God, you hear of the very same God, of the very same death, of the very same Christ who came down, and on top of it being a moving moment, when they're stirred, us English-speaking people, we're stirred too. When they're moved by the word going out, when they're moved by a song hitting that third stanza, when they're moved, you're, you're collectively moved with them, though possibly with a one or two second delay. And in these moments, it really is like Babel is being reversed before our eyes, where we, had, we have all the same tongue. Now, how did that happen? How can this all happen? I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you how you can hear the gospel in Estonia or in Nicaragua, or in Guatemala. I'll tell you how you can hear the gospel even when you're around people who are nothing like you. That man who came down from heaven, that man who came down to judgment, that man who came down from the cross, who was brought down into a grave, that man, here's why it happens, because that man was God who came down so that you could hear. And the story wasn't over when God came down It was actually just about to begin, and it would change everything. That man who came down into the grave three days later, what our scriptures say and what we know to be true, three days later on a Sunday, that man was brought back up. In Babel, we see God coming down and then God going back up. And other times in the scriptures, we see God coming down and then God going back up. And in the case of the cross and the death of Christ, we see God going down, but then we also see God being brought up three days later. God came down, and this time he went back up, but not just up a little. The Bible says that he ascended all the way up back into the heavens where he came from and where it says not even the heavens, the highest of heavens. He went all the way where he lives today ruling and reigning, down, up, down, up, down, up. And after he rose, watch this, wake up if you are asleep. Watch this. After he rose, the people were no longer confused, even though they were scattered out from Genesis 11. This time, it would be shown, we see this in Acts chapter 2, it would be shown that after Jesus went all the way up, it would be people who would come back together. His people who believed came together, and they gathered in a place called Jerusalem. You read this in Acts chapter 2. These people who were strangers, who were foreigners, speaking all kinds of different languages, having nothing in common, but they all came together at what is called scripturally Pentecost. And while, there, while they were there, there was this whooshing, piercing noise like an engulfment of the wind that came sweeping down from heaven. And it says there that they were all filled by the Spirit of God. And amazingly, at that moment, they all understood everything that one another was saying. Jews and Greeks could hear one another. Egyptians and Asians could hear one another. Arabs and the Mediterranean people could now hear one another. Men and women could hear this message all around them. And there, Acts says, there they all proclaimed and talked about one thing, the mighty deeds of God. They all understood each other. It says they were all amazed. But in Acts 2, 2 verse 12, they, some of them cried out, what does this mean? You take... Genesis 11, where people were confused. And then you take Acts 2, where everyone seemed to understand one another. What does this mean, they were saying? Friend, I'll tell you what this means, because it's public record. What does it mean? It means that God was 
continuing to build his kingdom. And at this moment in Acts chapter 2, where these people were no longer confused, it was God who finally built a new city with one people, with one language. But it didn't have a tower. This city had a throne. It's no longer the case that there's Babel or Babylon against a wandering people of God. These people are no longer wandering. They're no longer confused. They're brought together. They're now a new city. And like how enemy cities go by Babel or Babylon, God's city likewise has its own identifiers, its own names. A name is given to that city. We often see it called in the New Testament, the New Jerusalem. Or it's called the heavenly city. It's called Zion. Or in our case, most often, most commonly, in the letters of the New Testament, it's called the church. The people of God are being brought together under one name. But the name of that city that's used most often is the church. And so the church, think of this, every time we gather, the church, every time churches gather across the world, Scattered and gathered, every time a church gathers, it is like a foretaste of this new city. Every time we gather, it's a foretaste of heaven. Every time we go to the table, every time you might look over and see someone who was once like you very far away, but now is like you, redeemed and brought near because of the blood of the one who came down. Here in the church, here in this new city, there is one language that is spoken. There is one tongue that people understand one another by. That language, that tongue, that message is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here in the church, we gather together under one name, the name above every other name, the name that wasn't made for us by ourselves, but the name that was given to us by a very person, the Lord Jesus, who designs himself and shows himself to be our king. And here in this church, watch this, here in this church, we find our name. We have these people before who were wanting to make a name for themselves, and you and I already do have a name, but here in the church, we're actually, we're actually given a new name, a new name that's given to us. Unlike the name that Babel tried to give for herself, unlike the name that you hope to have, it's, a clear, it's clear all over Scripture that those who oppose the name of the Lord in order to have a name for themselves will be knocked over, but what God says in Christ is that he has been knocked over for you to have a new name a name that is above all others, to be your mark, to be your hope, to be your salvation, your place of refuge, anyone who turns from the tower they're building for themselves and, and places their hope in the work that's been done for them. Jesus says, the king of this city, Jesus says that he will not oppose you, but actually give you a new name. And this is what the church does. It recognizes the new tongue that you've been given, the new voice that you cry out with the new name that you have. And God grants his people a new name in his new city where you are called, according to Paul, an adopted son. Your name's son or daughter, brother or sister. You're a son or daughter of the king. And friends, if you're here today and you don't believe this, today is your day where you can place your hope in the one who came down. He has called out to you. In the same way that the Tower of Babel speaks to you today, it is God himself who calls out to you, who has set a table, and it's pictured later in Matthew as a table that has a chair that is waiting for you. The rest of the scriptures give pictures of this moment where there is a feast. There is a feast inside this celestial tower. There's a feast inside this amazing city. There's a feast where where you and I will one day sit around recognizing people who we have no idea who they are, recognizing though that they are a son and a daughter, and the scriptures call it a feast of Zion. Friends, let us rejoice, even in the horror of misery of those who were being judged or scattered about, but recognizing that even as you and I might approach whatever we approach, may we remember Babel on our way to the table. Let's pray. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you that we, can, that we can call out to you because of your name, that we can call out to you with certainty of your name, that we can call out to you because of your calling out to us, sons and daughters. We ask 
that you would lift our eyes to the holy hill of Zion, recognizing that it is you, a slain lamb, a conquering lion, who continues to guide us and direct us. May we worship you like we ought. May we cling to you like ones who have been bought. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.